Hello, everyone, and welcome to part four of our Water Energy Food Nexus speaker series. This series is hosted by the following Johns Hopkins University Advanced Academic Programs, the Environmental, Environmental Sciences and Policy, Energy Policy and Climate, and Geographic Information Systems. My name is Dr. Cassandra Hansen, and I'm the Program Coordinator for the Environmental Sciences and Policy and GIS Program. With that said, I am so pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gannett Holler. She's the Associate Professor of Atmospheric Science at the University of Utah and Research Director at uh, Storm Peak Laboratory in Colorado. Dr. Holler specializes in using high quality measurements of trace gases, aerosol physical and chemical properties, and cloud microphysics to understand the connections between the biosphere, atmosphere, and climate, along with the impact of anthropogenic emissions on these connections. So as you know, her talk today will introduce the connections between energy, water, and food, the next is the topic of this series, with the focus specifically on the impacts of climate change and agricultural expansion that is altering the landscape of the US Great Plains, thus producing the increase of windblown dust. She'll share with us today recent results from satellite data combined with surface network to show a significant increase in airborne dust over the past two decades. So this is certainly a hot topic and one to pay close attention to over the next months and years. Um, Dr. Holler, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, we're so happy to have you here. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn over the sharing power to you and I will mute myself and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansen. It's really an honor to be here today and speak to you all about some of our recent work. And um, I've had the privilege of knowing Dr. Hansen for many years and had the privilege of working with her. So it's a real, real honor to be here today. So what I wanted to start with today is this um, image here, which is of a dust storm in Colorado. And the reason I selected this image is because um, to begin my talk, I'd like to start with a radio show that the BBC recently did about our work. I feel like this summarizes our work very clearly and very concisely. I do want to acknowledge that this work was done um, by Andy Lambert, who was a graduate student in my group at the time, and this represents his master's thesis. And um, he is now at the US Naval Research Laboratory in Monterey, California, and we're continuing to work on, a, on this uh, together. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start with that radio interview right now, and I hope you guys can hear this well. To the other extreme, a return towards the 1930s Dust Bowl conditions of the American Midwest, made famous by the folk songs of Woody Guthrie and in John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath during the depths of the Great Depression. It was a paper posted earlier this month that alerted the world to the returning trends. On October the 11th, the day before the study was put online, a storm blew up across the Midwest that underlined just how conditions are changing there. A 300 kilometre wall of dust that NASA watched from space and that Christy Stulp videoed from her Colorado farmyard following a heads up from her husband. Yes, it was Sunday afternoon and he was finishing planting wheat. He could see it coming in and we'd known, of course, from our local weathermen that it would be coming in. So, yeah, he just told me to go out and take a look at it make sure all the barn doors were shut and that all the kids were inside the house and you just kind of batten down the hatches and wait for it to roll by. You know, and our, our weatherman, Brian Bledsoe, said, you know, even his family has a large ranch and the dirt was moving there, you know, just as much. It started in northern Colorado and came down. So it was moving the pastures, moving everything that day. And even for someone raised in the Midwest, this haboob, as the storm is called, was noteworthy. I think so. You know, I've grown up in this area and I don't remember the storms ever being this bad, the wind storms that would hit. I don't remember any really from, from when I grew up. I'm 43. But we have had them more lately. And that's what graduate researcher Andy Lambert had seen while preparing his thesis on atmospheric dust at the University of Utah. We have seen increases in exceedances of air quality standards that are set by the Environmental Protection Agency. So they set a threshold at a certain concentration for particles, and especially we're talking about large particles when we're talking about dust. And 
these levels were not when we looked at this for maybe the first decade between 2000 and 2010 or so these levels weren't exceeded at all in most of the Great Plains and the change that we've seen there is that these levels are now being exceeded once or twice every few years across many of the Great Plains states. These areas include North and South Dakota, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and western Minnesota. So that is the same area that was impacted by the Dust Bowl. I just blowed in and I got them Dust Bowl blues. I just blowed in and I got them Dust Bowl blues. Unsurprisingly, the Dust Bowl, that totem of American folk history, looms large over the paper Gannett Hallar wrote with her graduate student Andy Lambert. I've seen the dust so black that I couldn't see a thing. I've seen the dust so black that I couldn't see a thing. And the wind so cold, boy, it nearly cut your water off. The paper is based on techniques she developed to detect dust as opposed to other particulates from NASA satellite data, as well as a range of ground-based sensors. The trend, she says, is unmistakable. So we're looking at about a 5% increase per year in dust. And when you consider that over a 20-year period, you're looking at nearly a doubling of the dust. And we have seen these increases in dust events directly correlated with land use change, and in particular, agricultural changes. The irony is, in much of the Midwest, expansion of maize production has been encouraged by biofuel incentives intended to offset global warming. And as other researchers have noted, this has meant grasslands with year-round cover have been ploughed up to make way for seasonal crops echoes of what happened when tractors first arrived on the Great Plains. And there's a feedback that could follow that worries Andy Lambert. The biggest feedback that we're worried about is the process of desertification. That when you have soils destabilized by cropland expansion, they suddenly become more likely to produce dust emissions when you have stronger winds that move over them. And once that happens, once dust is emitted from these soils, it removes important nutrients for vegetation growth that helps to stabilize those soils. And suddenly they become more susceptible to wind erosion of dust. And that kind of process of desertification is the same thing that we saw in the 1930s with the Dust Bowl. Amplifying the human effects in the 1930s were the impacts of climate. 1936 remains to this day the hottest summer on record in the Midwest. 1934, the driest. Crops and grasslands perished in the heat. And this year saw studies saying that greenhouse warming may have made those conditions much more likely and that the western US may just be entering a mega drought not seen in 500 years. The dust increases of the past two decades may only be the beginning, says Gannett Hallar. We're not there yet by any means, but again, we think that this trend is emerging and that it needs to be discussed so that not so much farming practices, I would push it more towards uh, government regulations pertaining to farming should be considered carefully. We need to really look at climate change and what's happening there. On her Colorado farm, Christy Stulp agrees. As farmers, I think that we have some definite opportunities to improve things. Right now, though, a problem is economics. Farmers have to do what's going to work for the banker. Now, of course, we want to do what's best for the land because long term, that will increase our profitability more than anything else. But when we're in the kind of situation we are right now, with a trade war with China, <laughs> and we can't even produce a bushel and make any money, that's a real problem. So it's economics or driving a lot of how farmers farm, but then you also get some of these climate change events, and when they collide together, it's not a good thing. These dusty blues are the dustiest ones I know. These dusty blues are the dustiest ones. I Thank you all for um, taking the opportunity to listen to that. I um, wanted to credit Roland Pierce, who worked very hard on creating that. Um, radio segment about our work, and um, he also created a um, 
article in Science Magazine for the general public about her work. And um, I think he did a very good job of going out and speaking to a great deal of researchers to put our work in context, as well as talking to uh, farmers. So um, with that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the work that we've been doing. And to start with, I wanna stress the importance of dust. Mm -hmm. And first give credit to uh, Talia Lambert, who is actually Andy's wife, that's a graphic artist that created this figure for us. So um, on the importance of dust, we have to start with thinking about how dust is generated. So um, changes in land use uh, reduce the threshold for which dust can be generated. In other words, if you disturb the soil by grazing land with cattle or by tilling land through agricultural practices, you will end up allowing for lower wind speeds to loft that dust into the air. Once the dust is lofted into the air, we have um, a uh, impacts from that dust, and one of which is contributing to visibility reduction. And this is actually something that's regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency for all class one wilderness areas. And they do that through a network called IMPROVE, which I'll be discussing a great deal today. And then next, um, there's quite a bit of literature out there about dust storms and dangerous driving conditions and the hazards that these large dust storms cause. Um, finally, uh, epidemiologists have studied the impact of dust and aerosols in general on cardiovascular and respiratory complications. But there is some literature suggesting these coarse mode, which means these larger particles like dust, are actually having uh, a different type of impact on cardiovascular um, systems. And then next is the climate impact. So you have the direct effect, which is the effect of dust interacting directly with radiation. So those particles can absorb or scatter light in the atmosphere, creating a warming or cooling effect. And then you also have the indirect, in which dust in particular acts very effectively, depending on its mineral composition, as ice nuclei and potentially as cloud, condens cloud condensation nuclei. So ice nuclei meaning that it can allow for the formation of ice in the atmosphere and cloud condensation nuclei allowing for it to uptake water in the atmosphere. And this is a um, significant uncertainty in climate change projections. What will the impact of aerosols be on the radiative balance? And what that means is if aerosols create more clouds, will they temper the global warming that we see from greenhouse gases? And then finally, our group has um, done quite a bit of work on looking at dust on snow. So when you have these large dust storms, especially in the Western United States in the springtime, that dust can land on the snow. It then changes the albedo, meaning the color of the snow. It creates a much darker surface. That darker surface absorbs more energy and thus it melts the snow faster. And um, at the end of this talk, I'll, I'll show a study that we recently conducted in the Wasatch, which is here in Utah, in which one dust storm contributed significantly to the snow melt and timing of the snow melt in this region. So as was mentioned in that radio interview, um, there is a feedback effect here that has been studied for the 1930s Dust Bowl and I want to bring um, up right now. And that feedback effect is um, dust and desertification. So as you have land use changes, meaning that you develop more of that land, you then decrease the soil stability. That soil stability then creates dust emissions. This depletes the soil of its nutrition and that cycle continues to um, evolve, creating desertification. So um, as Andy mentioned that radio interview, that's really the concern that we're seeing this emerging trend, which could continue to accelerate in the future and um, create more dust. So I wanted to um, acknowledge a paper that was done by McClure and Jaffe in 2018, which really inspired our work. I was um, very interested in their results that are shown here. So on the left, you're looking at PM 2.5, which is particulate matter smaller than 2.5 microns. And in particular, you're looking at the 98th percentile. So that means the most extreme events, the ones that are in that top two extreme. 
the stop 2% extreme. And this data all comes from the improved network, which I mentioned previously, which is a network to um, verify visibility in class one wilderness areas. And this data sets from 1988 to 2016. And what you see on the left here is that PM 2.5 and you see this big bullseye basically over um, the northwestern um, part of the United States, specifically Idaho. And the paper talks a great deal about this um, trend that they're seeing in the most extreme events and that be doing but that um, is caused by increases in wildfire. Our group has also um, published a few papers about how wildfires are increasing aerosols in the atmosphere, especially in this region. But what interests me about this paper, I didn't find the left results so surprising, though it's very, very good work. What I found was in the um, appendix of the paper on the right that was really surprising. So this is data from MODIS, which is a satellite in the um, in space that measures aerosol optical depth. I'll talk more about that in regards to our work. And using MODIS data, they looked at the most extreme events also. And you can see that the spatial area is very different on the left graph, which represents the aerosols at the surface, versus the right graph, which represents the aerosols throughout the entire column. And that got me thinking about why and what's going on in the Midwest, because there is a uh, significant increase in the aerosols in the Midwest, but it's only showing up in the column and not as clearly at the surface. And dust is lofted very quickly from the surface upwards in the atmosphere. And so that inspired um, Andy to start as an undergraduate and then continue on as a master's student investigating these trends in dust. And that is the area that we were most interested in where we did not see an increase at the surface, but we did see an increase in the column. This spatial discrepancy led to our work. So this is the satellite um, that I mentioned previously, the instrument aboard both the Aqua and Terra satellite that's run by um, NASA as part of the Earth Observing Network. And MODIS in particular has 36 bands from 0.4 to 14 microns with global coverage approximately every two days. And what our group is interested in is looking at um, the aerosol optical depth, which is signified throughout this entire talk as AOD. And we use the different wavelengths of light and ratio those with each other to get a, a, a um, variable that we call the angstrom exponent. And the angstrom exponent is a very good proxy for size. So um, the angstrom exponent is inversely proportional to aerosol size. And that allowed us to create a technique that we actually tested a great deal um, from Storm Peak Laboratory, which is the site that um, Dr. Hansen mentioned in the beginning. We have a similar instrument at the surface. And over the years, we've looked at dust storm after dust storm. And we published a paper in 2015 in which we were able to uh, validate that we could use uh, the angstrom exponent to specifically pick out dust storms. And we look at, in this case, angstrom exponents less than 0.75. So that allowed for us to consider that area of the Western United States and look specifically for dust trends. And as I mentioned previously, what we found was a um, increase in dust across the Great Plains. And this is shown in red in this figure. And you see the bright red signifying a 5% increase per year over this 18 year time frame, and the blue indicating a decrease in aerosols, um, in dust in particular, across that same time frame. And uh, to show you the statistical significance of this data, I included um, a p-value here of 0 0.05. So anything that has a box around it is statistically significant to that extreme. And so we took each individual um, swath of MODIS and then looked at the uh, spatial average within this area to look for these trends. And we really honed in on this area of the Midwest. And that included 
North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Minnesota, Iowa, and Missouri. And uh, what you see here is a zoomed in image from the plot previously in which we can show that um, these are the trends in all observations over those 18 years. And this percent change is based on the median AOD dust for each tile. So for example, you can see this very strong signal in Iowa, central Iowa, also in um, Western Oklahoma, and the outline tiles indicate statistically significance again. So we started to wonder about what's creating these changes in dust. And um, throughout the literature, there is extensive information regarding land use changes over the same time period of the early 2000s with a rapid grassland to cropland conversion that was primarily spurred by a biofuel boom. Um, there's approximately 5,003, excuse me, 530 hectare acres decline in grasslands over this region during that approximate time frame from 2006 to 2011. And this really um, brought to the questions of desertification again. So in order to validate that, that the increase in dust that we're observing may be due to the change in cropland, we went ahead and looked at the cropland data layer, which is uh, produced by the US Department of Agriculture. And it um, is 30 meter cropland classification product. And it uses two different satellites, Landsat and MODIS imagery, along with other data sets to first of all, look at conversion of um, grassland to cropland, but then also provide information about the type of crop. Unfortunately, this data set wasn't available for our entire time frame, um, but we did have data from 2008 to 2018. So on the left here is the figure I showed you before of the MODIS trends um, in which we saw these increases in dust. And on the right is the trend in cropland coverage. So a change from a grassland to a cropland over those same regions. And just by your eye, I hope you do see that there are quite a few similarities between these two graphs. But to take that a step further, we did a lag correlation. So we looked for correlations between the MODIS imagery that measures the amount of dust in the atmosphere and the cropland database. And what we saw is that um, these correlations, first of all, were statistically significant. Um, these are your p-values here shown in your uh, the size of the circle. So we're showing very strong statistical significance. Um, they had a very high correlation. And on top of that, they really correlated with what we would expect based on the wind direction. So we saw that this correlation was highlighted at, with a Northwest maximum, um, that suggesting that not only are you seeing the dust correlate with the general area of the cropland expansion, but you're also seeing the correlation increase even further in the direction that the wind blows. So the dust is moving that, um, the, the, the wind is moving that dust in uh, a direction that we expect. So that was a pretty big finding in itself, but I asked uh, Andy to go a step further and really think about, well, what is the surface telling us? And can you start to understand the dust in terms of specific crop types. And in order to do that, um, Andy started looking at ground-based observations. And in particular, he looked at observations from the Interagency Monitoring of Protected Visual Environment Network, which is the improved network I've mentioned several times. And how this network works is you, the, um, out in these class one wilderness areas in very remote places, they set up filter samples. And what that means is they have a great big pump that pulls air through a media, some sort of filter. It's normally um, can be quartz or Teflon. And you collect the particles on that filter. Someone goes out every three days and analyzes, collects the filter, takes it back to a lab and performs analysis. 
And in particular, they look for dust and they do that using a elemental signature of dust. So he was able to look at the data set over the same time frame for dust. And um, he was also able to use a different system, which is the NASA aerosol robotic network, which has instruments that look like this picture on the bottom here, which is called a CML sun photometer. And what that instrument does is it constantly um, collects the light directly from the sun and it tracks the sun continuously. And from that information, it can then um, calculate out the aerosol optical depth at specific wavelengths. So this instrument is incredibly similar to the satellite instrument that I told you before, but instead of looking down from space, it's looking up from the surface. So uh, this instrument also had much faster time and better temporal resolution. So it collected about every 15 minutes. And um, from this, we were also able to use the same technique to pull out the dust signal. I wanted to highlight with the slide that these are two very distinct data sets. And I think that's important because they're collected in completely different ways, but yet um, we ended up seeing quite similar results. So these data sets differ in temporal coverage. They differ between the networks. They differ from site to site. They, uh, one does measurements just at the surface while the other one looks at the entire column. And they also have different temporal resolution. So uh, this is a um, indication of the data availability in particular in this Midwest region. So we're looking at Aeronet sites that have between 10 and 15 years of data, and then the improved sites, which have between 10 and 15 years of data. And overall in the Midwest, we found that there were 170 sites combined with at least seven years of observations, which really allowed us to do further validation to the satellite data that we um, had analyzed. So now when we start to dive into that idea of, can we specifically attribute these trends to agriculture going further than just the large scale crop land change? And this is similar to the paper, the Jaffe paper I showed earlier. This is looking at, nine, um, at 90th percentiles, so quadrile trends. So this is looking at the most extreme events. So the monthly most extreme events, what are those events that are the top 10% of extremes? And what we see is that mainly you see positive trends throughout this region, mainly during months associated with planting and harvesting. So um, specifically, we're showing the months here of March, June, and October. And I wanna take this a step further by showing you some uh, very specific sites and talking about what we know about those sites in terms of cropland change over the last 15, 15 to 20 years. So we'll start with soybeans. So we know that there was an expansion in soybeans um, in this site in central Iowa and soybeans are planted and harvested in June and October. And we see that increase both in June and October Again, uh, we're using the same uh, format that we used before, where red is an increasing trend and blue is a decreasing trend. And the circle is indicating to you the, um, approx the um, excuse me, the percentage per year. And the shape is indicating to you the type of measurement made. There's a lot, of, there's a lot to this graph. And whether or not the shape is colored tells you whether or not statistically significant. So you see there's a statistical significant approximate 10% increase per year in this region in June and October, which are where the months that we expect that to happen because using the cropland data, we can show that the expansion in this area was due to soybeans, which are both planted and harvested at that time. We do not see that increase in March, which is important also because we wouldn't expect to see that increase in March. So that's for central Iowa. Now let's move on to northern Oklahoma. In northern Oklahoma, we again see uh, expansion of winter wheat planting uh, based on the cropland database. 
and planting and harvesting occur in October and June. So if you look at this figure, we see that that's red showing a statistically significant increase in October and June, and we don't see that increase as distinctly in March. Going to the next location, let's look at central Nebraska. Central Nebraska, we saw a increase in corn planting based on the um, cropland data. Corn planting uh, takes a great deal of surface clearing, specifically in March. We do see that statistical significant increase in March over that region. We do not see that statistical increase in either June or October. So this gave us further confidence in our methodology that we were able to pick out specific months and look at when the extreme events were occurring and connect that back to the crop type and the expectation on planting and harvesting. So overall, we, um, I wanted to summarize these results and then talk a little bit about some of our other work in dust in particular. But um, we have seen this rapid cropland expansion, which is spatially correlated both with dust measurements from space. And uh, we see this trend that the dust is as expected based on the wind direction going downwind to the northwest where we see the biggest increases in dust. We see a monthly, a positive monthly trend in a surface-based remote sensing technique, as well as a surface-based filter technique that both measure dust, which coincide with planting and harvesting seasons for these predominant crops. Um, we are concerned with uh, the high uncertainty in future drought estimates for this region, um, combined with the rapid agriculture expansion, as we believe this could present a threat for potential land degradation and desertification. And just as an example, I'll mention a paper done by Catherine Hayhoe's group that came out in 2015, where she suggested that there could be between an estimate of 50 to 200% increase in summertime drought risk in the Great Plains in response to a warming, a global warming of one to four degrees. So um, as we're looking at climate projections in the future, there are a great deal of concerns that the Great Plains could undergo a pretty massive drought. Um, thus, we, we talk a lot about our data being, our, our, sorry, our research group being data driven. So we didn't use a model, we only use data. We try to look for emerging trends using large databases. We would suggest that we're definite, well, in this case, we are definitely seeing a strong emerging trend towards an increase in dust. Thus, we um, strongly suggest policy changes to reduce this desertification risk. And um, some examples of that, though I will say this is well outside the expertise of my group, we are not policy experts by any means, but based on the um, literature in literature available to us, we have suggested that um, potentially improve and expand existing policies such as the sod saver precision which reduces crop insurance subsidies in six states currently. Um, we do suggest strongly to expand the aerosol measurement network. We think this will help a great deal in understanding these trends and specifically their causes. The more instruments we have, the more clearly we could say what type of crops and where are causing these significant increase of dust, even going further to say what type of agricultural process, practices, excuse me. And then um, we encourage policies that consider land surface development restrictions. So uh, thinking about sensitive land and thinking about sensitive landscapes, which cannot be developed. So I wanted to end this aspect of the talk by talking about the impact that is right now, not in the future. This is the impact that's happening now. So, um, the Environmental Protection Agency has regulations in place to protect human health, and specifically those regulations are to maintain an air quality standard. And those air quality standards are based on different um, constituents in the atmosphere, including gases like ozone. And most people are pretty familiar with the ozone standards. They understand that they should never go running on a red day, but it's safe to go running on a a green day, especially if they live in urban areas. 
But there are also air quality standards for particulate matter. And um, there are air quality standards specifically for coarse particulate matter, such as dust, primarily dust. And by um, looking through the uh, Environmental Protection Agency database, Andy found that Kansas, in particular Topeka, Kansas, which is not a place where you expect very much pollution, had had no air quality exceedances whatsoever from 2000 to 2009. But from 2010 to 2018, they had one exceedance every three years. So that means that the air quality got to a extent that was harmful to human health, specifically that you had enough dust in the atmosphere to reach 150 micrograms per meter cubed for an eight hour period. So that is um, shown here. This is the, um, the consistent air quality index, which is used for the entire country. And it reached values of orange to red. Um, three times, or once every three years, excuse me. And then in South Dakota, they had had, again, zero exceedances from 2000 to 2009, but they've had one every two years from 2010 to 2018. So again, we want to stress that this dust isn't something in the future that could have harmful effects, but instead it is actually starting to have air quality impacts now. Okay. So with that, I'd like to segment just a little bit into a um, different aspects of our research group and other um, things that we are working on specifically focused on dust measurements. So I wanted to stress that in general, aerosol science covers a incredibly large scale. Um, we, in order to stay the atmospheric particles and the just in order to study the particles in the atmosphere, you have to study particles starting down at one nanometer, moving all the way up to thousands of microns. And this, this scale actually requires a lot of different technology and different types of measurement systems. And um, dust is extremely hard to measure in situ. And what I mean by in situ is it's very difficult to bring a dust particle from the atmosphere in ambient conditions into a lab, sample it, analyze it, and understand it. Um, and with that in mind, um, over the last 10 years, my research group has designed a new system, a new inlet system for the bedroom measurement of dust in particular. And this is an example of the system. This is actually at Storm Peak Laboratory. But there's now one at the University of Utah, one at NCAR, and, um, a few other research groups have asked me for the design, which I'm more than happy to freely give to anyone who's interested in building this. But this system um, allows for us to pull air fast enough and uh, reduces the number of bends and curves that allow us to aerodynamically get dust directly to an instrument. And this was published in um, 2019. And specifically what, we, what another graduate student in my group named Ross did is he set up a wind tunnel and was able to use a wand and spray dust across the air and then measure what size and what quantity of dust was able to go into the inlet and then understand the transmission of the dust through the inlet and to the system. And this is an example of this. And what we were able to show is that our system is actually um, the, the best available in collecting dust that we know of. And it can collect dust up to about 13 microns with 50% efficiency. So we're able to collect the dust that's in the atmosphere. Um, this is important because atmospheric scientists also often talk about and recently have published several papers about the missing course mode. It's only missing from our measurements. It's not missing from the atmosphere. So. And then finally, in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned the importance of considering dust on snow. And we collaborated extensively with Mackenzie Skiles, who's at the University of Utah as well, um, and was hired in a cluster uh, together. The two of us were hired together in a cluster to study these aspects. And what uh, we found was we set up a site at Alta, which is a, a ski town in Utah at the top of Little Cottonwood Canyon. And we have this small site in which we could collect 
aerosol particles in situ, meaning that we're sampling, we're sucking the air in right here at this uh, asparagus pod is what that is. We're bringing the air into the instrument, which is deployed. And then simultaneously, McKinsey's groups are measuring the dust on the snow, out there digging snow pits frequently to understand the amount of dust deposited in the snow. And we collaborated with, uh, excuse me, we collaborated with a group of modelers, John Lynn and Derek Malia, who were able to show us the, uh, where the dust is coming from and do very sophisticated back trajectory models. And in this paper, we showed one example, a student in my group um, will have another paper out soon, but this case study was uh, only lasted two days and essentially brought about 50% of the dust for the entire season to the mountains and into the snowpack. This is important because throughout this talk, I've been talking about these extreme events getting more extreme. That's really what we're seeing, the increase in the highest uh, percentiles. So this one event, we saw this significant increase in observations of PM 2.5. And we showed that a great deal of this dust was coming either from the Great Salt Lake or the Great Salt Lake Desert, which really signified uh, some important human induced changes. The Great Salt Lake here in Utah is decreasing at a very fast rate due to the increase in population of Salt Lake City and surrounding regions, which are requiring a higher water demand. But as the lake decreases, you have an increased amount of dust being lofted from the lake. And what we, what this paper suggests is that the implications of that dust on the snow and then melting the snow at a faster rate, which makes it more difficult for water managers to uh, allocate to reservoirs is something that has to be considered. So just to summarize that result, and I know I'm um, running out of time here, the first study was to target, uh, it targeted a single dust event to assess the life cycle of the dust from the source to the sink. So in order to see where the dust came from and where it landed and to quantify the rate of impact of that deposited dust. This was the first time we had simultaneous measurements to our knowledge ever of the dust size distribution. So using atmospheric science perspective in the air and then as well as in the snow uh, working closely with snow hydrologists, McKinsey Scales. And this work confirmed that the dust mass deposited from this single storm account for 50% of the whole season. And um, it had a very significant radiative impact. It changed the color of the snow, which allowed for more energy to be absorbed and thus accelerated the snow melt by about 25%. Okay, so I did want to end there to make sure to leave plenty of time for questions. But first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the large research team that has contributed to this work. Um, I won't be able to speak to each of their, them individually, but this is the research team on the left at the University of Utah, uh, who, as all of you, deserve so much acknowledgement, especially for working so hard throughout all of COVID and these challenging situation. And then on the right is the research team at Storm Peak Laboratory, which is again, a high elevation facility located in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And the very top are my kids who deserve some credit for letting me do all this work all the time. And uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge some specific individuals in this work here on the top and also acknowledge uh, our group's funding from many different sources for this work over the years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Holler. That was amazing. Um, we have a couple of questions that are coming in, but before we dive into the questions, I'll, I'll let the, the community get some time to type in their questions. Just wanted to give you a virtual round of applause. That was very interesting. So thank you. Um, one question that did come in specifically to satellite imagery or possibly using a different approach. Um, did your group look into Calypso? to get a three-dimensional representation of what's going on within the column from the dust aspects? That's a great question. So um, not in this paper, but what we're using Calypso for now more so is to do individual case studies. So I'm sure the person who asked that question understands that Calypso has a very narrow footprint. So it's very difficult to get large statistical, um, large spatial and statistical uh, understanding from Calypso, but it's a great 
Great question. So right now we're starting to use Clipso to specifically understand plume height. And uh, Kai Wood, who's uh, pictured on that last slide, he's working on his PhD, looking at plume height of wildfire plumes. But we have been talking a great deal about implementing that to look at these kind of extreme dust storms and to try to understand the height of the plume. And that would help us understand the spatial extent to which the plume can travel. So good question. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, you know, the, this research, you started off in the beginning with a, a wonderful audio interview from the BBC. And I've seen that your research has been mentioned in Science Magazine and, and well published. But the next step, I mean, this is important information to get out to the, the public. And I feel like in academia, you know, we're in such a small little cell of where our research goes. And you, you mentioned that, you know, next steps perhaps involving policy, but, you know, that's not your lane. Um, how does this information, is your team focused on trying to get it out more so to the general public or what are, what are your thoughts here? You know, what's been really interesting about this experience is that we published this paper in October and we received a, um, a great deal of press interest only from Europe. So uh, the Science Magazine was a, a British journalist, the BBC, we were in a lot of European newspapers, et cetera. There was very, very little interest from media in the United States. And in the last month that has really flipped which has been great to see. Um, we've gotten quite a bit of media interest and I don't, I don't completely understand that delay, but we've received a lot of media interest from the US. And that actually has been really helpful because we've been, um, in particular, there is a couple of journalists who are interested in doing these kind of very large segments that go from here are the results to where is the policy going? And that has generated these conversations. I, I would say the media has generated these conversations where they're asking us to do um, to have discussions with policymakers, and that is actually I, th I think that's actually really been critical in this in this process. So mm -hmm. I, I I hope that we can continue those kind of conversations. It is it is always challenging for me to um, have our work uh, like I, I feel like we've I finally honed in. It's taken me a lot many many years getting our work to modelers so that it can be incorporated in like either regional models or global climate modelers. And that's that's worked. But now to get to policymakers is really the next step. And I, I would say I'm still working on that. Um, I will acknowledge that the University of Utah has a global change and sustainability center. And that has really helped in that process where they've specifically tried to do cluster hires around faculty who could be on the science side, but then also on the policy side that intercept each other. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Also another idea too, for getting it into the public's eyes and even into you know, the United States viewpoint is, is focusing it around health. And I think that's you mentioned in the beginning, you know, the fact that dust can cause respiratory issues. You know, we also are seeing a connection of health issues linked to temperature, high increase of temperature, but I, I think that might be another avenue to get more of that information in, in front of people in the United States. Um, another question that came in, um, let's see. So you did mention it briefly about um, perhaps different uh, farming practices. Um, do you see less du dust in fewer extreme events where crop covers and other better farming techniques are practiced? Are it's you guys a, able to pull that? Yeah, it's a great question. I would say at this point, just to be very clear, I would say at this point, we can't necessarily say that with confidence, mm -hmm. but what I can say is that the cropland database that we use looks specifically at changes in land. So expansion of agricultural lands and farmers are going to be farming their best land. And so if they're expanding into new areas, most likely those are marginal lands. And we can also say with confidence that those expansions went from a grassland, which is more of a crop cover, to a, um, to a crop. And that we can clearly see a correlation between that expansion and an increase in dust. So you could, you could theoretically go to the opposite. If you, uh, to, to, you know, to answer his question, if you see the correlation between the expansion into marginal lands and increase in dust, 
I expect if we moved it back the other way to see a decrease in dust, but we of course cannot say that we saw that in our data. Great, thank you. That answered the question, but yeah. um, to Tom, feel free to put in, put in clarification if needed. Uh, absolutely, and one thing I really enjoyed about your topic is, I mean, it really does do the full gamut of nexus and talking about wildfires, talking about dust, talking, you know, and all these, these feedback loops. And, and we typically talk about them almost individually as their own thing, you know, but what, the, what I like about this is that it, it really does involve dust on snow, ash on snow, you know, impact salt on snow, impact of snow, um, groundwater, and really putting that into place of what does that mean for croplands and, and weather cycles. So that was just, it's just, I think it's a different approach that we need to, instead of thinking about these individually, is really seeing that whole overarching effect of it. So thank you for really emphasizing that. So we have a couple more minutes if there's any additional questions. Um, there's been great questions so far. I would definitely like to acknowledge again, Andy Lambert, who did this as his master's thesis, and I'm excited to see what he does next in terms of his uh, career. It's gonna be fun to watch. Absolutely. Well, I would encourage everyone um, in the question and answer to give a virtual round of applause for Dr. Heller and her time. And thank you so much again for just a wonderful presentation, very informative. And um, I can definitely assure that there'll be follow-up questions for sure. Great, well, thank you all for joining. I'm really happy that you're interested in our work. And um, as Dr. Hansen mentioned, we do, I didn't talk about today, but we do spend a lot of time looking at aridity. So, um, drought and wildfire in the West and how that's impacting um, aerosol loading. And we've been able to, uh, again, look at trends and a lot of our work currently is looking at trends moving forward in terms of extreme fires and what we should expect for air quality in the future, especially in urban areas. So if you're interested in that work, please look for a paper coming out relative, well, coming out very soon. I mean, we just went through our second round of revisions by um, Will Mott, who's a student in my group who uh, we'll have a paper out soon about that. Absolutely. We will be, we'll be looking for your research and um, sharing it amongst our students for sure. Thank you so much for doing such wonderful work. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was really, it was really nice to get the opportunity to talk about this. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, again, Dr. Heller, thank you so much. And I wish you and your team and your family and everyone that supported your research, wish you guys well. Thank you. Thank you. And you as well. Thank right. you so much. You guys have Take a wonderful care. day.